Well, let's uh, let's bow our heads in prayer and be encouraged that um, as we pray faithfully, as we seek God, that um, He He moves in our prayers. Um, you'll recall the promise that He makes in Matthew six thirty three, which is. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You know, the various needs that we have in our families, of course, and then um, of those that we've shared who are going through things that are burdens on our heart, and we want the Lord to move in those things. Um, you know, the, the condition that Jesus attaches to um, our experiencing God's fullness in the, in the answering of the prayers that we offer him and, and all the needs that we not only express for ourselves, but those for others too. That condition is that we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, that we seek him. And we're told too and that, uh, that the prayers of a righteous man or woman, that they are powerful and effective, that they avail much. And uh, when we pray, there may be a temptation to look for immediate, obvious solutions to the needs that we've talked about, answers to the prayers, and sometimes God does that. But we forget that so much of what is going on in the reality around us is actually on the unseen plane the spiritual forces that are at work in the world that strive against God, against us, his people, against the glory of Jesus and, and how, <clears throat> how those principalities that Ephesians 6 talks about, how they war against the, um, um, our agenda of seeking God first and pursuing his righteousness. So um, much of the time, the answers to our prayers are happening in ways that we can't see right away. And we are tempted to lose heart when we don't see those quick, obvious solutions. But, and, and if that is the position we come to, if we, if we despair in our prayer, then we... Um, ultimately will not be looking when the answers are revealed. And uh, God has to train us to move a mindset, move from a mindset that is physical and material to a mindset that is spiritual and eternal. And uh, sometimes we give up too easily in our prayers. Um, sin you know, it hinders our prayer life. It hinders um, our experiencing God's provision for our prayers. Um, sin is, of course, what catalyzes the, the brokenness of our world. In, Ro in Romans, it talks about how all of creation groans in anticipation for the revealing of Christ and of Christ's people. To overcome the brokenness that our sin has brought to the world all the suffering that comes from our sin, that comes from the sin of those who've lived before and still affect us today. So don't lose heart. And uh, when we pray, remember to keep things, the first things first, you know, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and, and then trust him with all the needs that we, we talk about. And maybe the needs we don't talk about, but ought to, or at least ought to pray for. Uh, an unspoken request that was mentioned, you know, and we don't know what that is, but we can still pray for it, and God knows what it is, and God can answer it. So, uh, whatever is on your heart tonight, as, you, as I lead us, you pray also, and just uh, um, seek to entrust that burden, that care, that pain, that brokenness, whatever it is, into his hands. The uncertainty of a future that we don't see clearly now but God knows whatever it is seek to entrust those things to his hands so let's pray Father we, 
we bless your name and we thank you Lord God that we do have the opportunity tonight to come to you in prayer Lord and we know father that that as we do so we're coming to you of course in the only with the only credential that allows us to do so and that is that the blood of Jesus Christ has been applied to us as we've trusted him individually here tonight trusted him to be Lord and Savior of our lives having repented of our sin and turning to him Lord we know that we're cleansed and made new and made right with you and that we have access to your throne by which Lord we can cry out to you and and bring to you in our weak and feeble hands Lord the burdens that we can't carry with shoulders that are being crushed by the weight of sin and pain and sorrow in the world around us and so Lord God we look to you and we entrust to you the things that we've been sharing tonight the burdens the challenges the pain Lord the uh, the, the futures Lord that uh, may seem unclear to us the decisions that lay before us or before our loved ones father but father we pray that you'll move in such a way that your perfect perfect plan will be realized in the experience of each person whose life these needs touches that your perfect will will be done and that father uh, nothing less would happen nothing that is short of your goodness Lord in the needs that we've talked about in the needs of each life that we've mentioned this evening Lord that uh, your your goodness the fullness of that would be realized and Lord that you would be glorified Lord, we know that all of this life is intended Lord it's permitted so that Lord we learn to not trust in our own strength and learn to not trust in the ways of the world father but to learn to trust in you and you alone and so, Father, we come to you with our spiritual eyes looking to you. With ears, I, I pray, that are open to your word as your Holy Spirit takes what we talk about tonight and brings to our hearts those things, Lord, those messages that you wish to impart to us. And that your Spirit, Father, that he would take those messages, that word from you, Lord, and bring about the healing that we need the changes in our attitude father that we need and most of all most of all Lord that they would bring us into an encounter with you the love of our lives because Lord you are the most precious treasure that any of us can experience or share with one another so we give you the glory we pray, Lord, in all these things for your will to be done. And in the name of Jesus, amen. <clears throat> so, um, we, you know, we've been in 1 Samuel and we've been reading through various chapters. Of course, it's been a couple of weeks, so uh, a little refresher is in order, I think. But um, it's, it's an appropriate time for us to be looking at some of the things that we'll be talking about as we consider um, the, uh, the principles at work and how God reveals himself in 1 Samuel chapter 5, which is what we're reading tonight. You know, last week we had a uh, departure from our regular Bible study so that we could um, have a time of worship and reflection and and the opportunity to look at our lives and our need to just come clean with God, um, <coughs> to enter into these weeks that precede Easter Sunday <clears throat> with an attitude that is appropriate, you know, as the children of God, realizing what it cost God for us to have the forgiveness of our sin. So as we read in 1 Samuel, up <clears throat> up through the chapters that precede what we're reading tonight and including what we read tonight, there is, I hope, a, a, a revelation to us, every one, of, in, every one of us in here, that the God who is working, the God who is organizing and orchestrating world events according to a plan that only he knows, that this God is so different from humanity 
that it's alien to us, that it, it seems bizarre and crazy compared to the way and all the ways that the world operates. You know, if you had to describe the world, what are some words and its condition? What are some words that come to your mind? Sinful. Okay, sinful. Okay. Broken. Broken. What? Sad. Sad. All right. What are some other words? <clears throat> what are some values that the world holds dear that maybe um, aren't so important to the people of God or shouldn't be that important to the people of God? Self. What's that? Self. Self. Right. Yeah. It's all about me. Right. What else? There's no real wrong answer. Well, there might be. Let's find out. <laughs> Somebody say greed. Greedy? Yeah. Greed is a, a worldly value. Yeah. Yeah. Corrupt. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm probably, it's not really that we're having trouble. Uh, finding words is so, that so many different words come to our mind. We could think of proud. Uh, we could we could uh, uh, talk about how um, uh, arrogant you know the world is, how fearful the world is, and and so forth and so on. All kinds of words that just just really describe our generation. I and, and I hear sometimes I hope hear preachers and they'll talk about our generation and so forth. Let me make this observation. <clears throat> the spiritual condition of the of people in the world really isn't very different than it ever has been. Sometimes we have the illusion because we live sometimes in a pocket and it may seem safe and secure where we live and, and so forth, but but somewhere in the world, in most places in the world, people are greedy, people are selfish, people are proud, people are not spiritual, they're materialistic, they're arrogant, they're fearful, they're hateful, they're resentful, they're envious and covetous, and you know, all the other words that we could throw out there, right? That's actually the way our world is. And I was kind of having, <clears throat> someone had uh, sent, this happens once in a while, so somebody had sent a, a message to me a question about some spiritual things and and they were expressing some grief over what they feel is the spiritual condition of the church collectively and that in their in their perspective that the the church at large is somewhat shallow and immature uh, materialistic and actually having a lot of the things the things that we just said and used to describe the world at large, and the, many of those words of words that this person was communicating were characterizing or describing the church. And their thought was, well, how did the church become this? And I, uh, I think of a couple of things. The first thing is that um, I don't know if it's really that different or as much different as we'd like to think that it is. Uh, but partly because many of us have, even in the churches that we felt were good, sometimes it was just because we didn't know all the other things that were going on. Um, my mind, when they shared this with me, went to the letters to the churches that Jesus has John the Revelator scribe in Revelation. And uh, in those letters we see churches that are proud and anxious and materialistic and disorderly and covetous and greedy and you know and, and all the, here here those words are again. And uh, I was struck by the realization that we feel it and it feels like it's different to us because we're in the middle of it. It's intense. We're experiencing it. But the spirituals, <clears throat> excuse me, the spiritual struggles that the church is having today 
are largely the same struggles the church has always had, and the church will not be perfect until Jesus comes back and takes us home. You know, so if a person is looking for the perfect church, I think they need to be careful what they mean by that. I think we need to be a church that seeks God, and, and in that way we are more they, the perfect church that, that he wants us to be, but at the same time, if we're looking for a church that has no conflict, if we're looking for a church that has no division, and we, we look for human beings in a church who are going to be perfect people, we're just going to constantly be sadly disappointed because they're still human and so forth. And I say all of that to say how important it is for you and for me to be on our guard, lest we think that we're immune to becoming that church we don't want to be, individually and corporately, because we can be. We can become materialistic. We can become proud. We can become self-centered and, and have such a narrow idea of what the kingdom is that we only think about our little corner of it and not think about the whole kingdom of God at work. When we read in 1 Samuel, there are some things that are very challenging and probably very convicting as we read those words. But one thing that I hope, no matter how uh, gritty it is as we read it, that we, that we take to heart, the one thing that I hope that we do is this realization that as, we, as we're reading these words and, and as we're looking at these, these uh, ages before us and these times that pass and so forth and from one person there comes a new leader, a new judge, and a new judge, a new judge, and eventually the kings, and then a new king, and a new king, and a new king, and a new king. And we see the ebb and flow of God's people and their spiritual condition before God is that God never gives up on his people. He never gives up on his people. That means that God, even though we do fall short, we can be comforted with this, that he's not going to give up on you. He's not going to give up on me. Now, that doesn't mean he'll just tolerate things that aren't what they're supposed to be. He doesn't tolerate things as they are with his people here. He deals with it because he's a God of love, and he knows that those things that they settle for, those things they sell their souls to, the, how those things rob them of the joy that only God can be to them. And so he wars against the lusts of their flesh, and he wars against the pride that they have in themselves, and knocks down those idols so that they can have a right and proper relationship with himself. So you'll recall, I hope, uh, that as we've been reading in 1 Samuel, some of that happening. Do you recall, what, if we had to summarize chapters 1 through 4, what would, what, would, what would we say? What would we point out? What would we acknowledge? Eli didn't control his kids and they <clears throat> turned away from God and sinned? They did. And they sinned terribly. I mean, they were hurting people. They were, they were uh, defiling God's name and, you know, basically throwing handfuls, spiritually speaking, of manure toward the name of God um, because of how they were behaving. And Eli, he, again, Eli wasn't judged because of what his sons were doing. He was judged because he didn't do anything about it. That's an important thing to remember because sometimes as parents we may feel our kids aren't living up to the way they ought to be and that can be very frustrating for us and, and scary for us and we may feel that God's angry with us because our, the choices our kids are, are, that our kids are making. Um, well, Samuel, he has some kids, of course. We haven't gotten to that point, but I'll just go ahead and say it. He has some kids and they don't really walk with God like they ought to either. And but he's not judged like Eli was. So, um, Eli's kids are doing this, but, but understand actually that it isn't just what Eli's kids are doing, it's that collectively the whole nation of Israel, remember, remember that the book of 1 Samuel comes as part of the same era as the, books, the book of Judges. You remember and you recall how the book of Judges went? How the people of God, what was the spiritual condition of the people of God throughout the book of Judges? Backslid. Yeah, they were like a yo-yo. You know, they were like, 
uh, you know, God would do a great work and there'd be for a little while people who are like, oh, God is great and we love God and we're going to walk with God and we'll never turn away and that kind of thing. And then just in a short amount of time, uh, their kids would grow up, you know, and they didn't really know God and they weren't interested in walking with God. And as a people, they would turn away and then God would let them be oppressed and they would suffer and suffer and suffer. And then he would send a redeemer. They would suffer so that they could reflect on their poverty apart from God. And he would send a redeemer so that they would remember that God is their redeemer. Just like he had redeemed them out of Egypt, God was redeeming them time and time and time again from the hands of the Canaanites and the, you know, and all the peoples that we read about in the Judges, Moabites, the Ammonites, and so forth and so on, Midianites. Lots of knights there, all kinds of bad knights in Canaan. And he would send a redeemer. And for a little while, again, for a little while, they would remember, you know, we ought to walk with God. God is great. God is good. We'll never turn away from him. And we're going to walk with him forever. And, and then again, they, you know, like a yo-yo. Back and forth, back and forth. And we are essentially, when we come to 1 Samuel, in this place of that farness from God. So it isn't that God is judging the people of Israel because of Eli's sons, but because the spiritual condition of Eli, of the people has tolerated what Eli's sons are doing. Nobody stops it, including Eli, because they're just not interested in walking with God on God's terms. They like the idea of God, if God is like the Canaanite gods who does just what they wanted, if they, they just do a certain thing, they give them a certain offering, he'll just give them what they want, that kind of thing. It's not relational, it's transactional. You know the difference? God does not require a transactional relationship with you that's based on anything that you and I can do. There is a transaction, and that's what Jesus did on the cross. He paid for our sin. We are redeemed, it means he paid for us to rescue us from our, the penalty of our sin, right? But he doesn't, there, there's a transaction, but the end isn't just our being content in of ourselves. It's so that you and I can walk in the purpose for which God created us. And that is what? What is the purpose for which God created you? Serve the Lord. The, to serve the Lord. And I might even back it up a little bit and be more fundamental and say, it's to love the Lord. You know, right? I mean, to love the Lord. We serve the Lord because we love the Lord. So here they are in an era where their hearts are far from God again. <clears throat> and as a result of that, uh, two things happen. Two huge things happen. One, it's for the house of Eli. Eli's sons die, just as God had said they would. And then Eli dies, just as God said he would. But then another big thing happens. Well, do you recall what that is? And that's what brings us to chapter 4. Eli's son's wife had a child. <clears throat> well, that's true. She died too, right? That's true. But there's something for the people of Israel that's really a big deal. Samuel. Well, that's true too. Yeah, that is true. I was thinking of this. I was thinking about the Ark of the Covenant. Do you remember what happened to the Ark of the Covenant? It was taken away. It was. And why is that a big deal? Because all the Israel thought that the Ark of the Covenant just belonged to them and the Lord was in the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, they basically thought of it as being God. Now, the Ark of the Covenant is symbolic of God's presence, and so it's important in that way, especially because we talked about this, how the cover of the, the, uh, the Ark um, which is made of acacia wood and it's overlaid with gold and so forth. But the cover, the lid of it, is uh, called the mercy seat. And it's where the blood of the sacrifices during the special um, uh, Day of Atonement sa uh, uh, sacrifices were applied. It was in, kept in the most holy place of the temple. And they recalled in the days of, the, of their exodus that they would take that ark before them into combat. Why? because the Ark of the Covenant was a magical totem or a, uh, an amulet of some kind, a good luck charm? No, but because it represented the presence of the Lord. It was a statement make, uh, that was made concerning 
the fact that God was going before them, that God himself was going before them and that he was fighting the, the battle for them. So on this occasion, something's about to happen that has never happened before. They take the ark out and they presume upon God as if, and, they, and they treat it as if it itself is God and just magically having it makes them Im immune to failure. No, they take it and it goes before them and then what happens to the ark? It's captured, which is hugely humiliating for the people of God because it's never happened. And it is a, in, from their perspective, it's sort of like the, um, the experience of feeling like God has forsaken them, that God has turned his back on them, that God has abandoned them. And in one sense, this is true. Now, God hasn't utterly done that, but he has left them to their own devices. He's left them to, uh, to what their strength can achieve for them, which is nothing. They cannot do anything in their own strength. So, of course, God allows the ark to be captured by the Philistines. And the Israelites are killed in a great rout. And uh, as we said, the uh, sons of Eli were killed. And Eli, in, in hearing the news, he's startled by the death of his sons, by that report. But what actually literally knocks him over the edge, because he was sitting on the you know, fence and he falls and breaks his neck. What, what does that is hearing the news that the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God, has been captured. And he realized, he realizes uh, just how serious that is. And you mentioned the daughter-in-law of Eli. She's giving birth. And do you remember what she named her son? She dies giving birth, but before she dies, she gives that son a name. It's very, very significant. It's Ichabod. Which means, anybody remember? It means that the glory has departed. The glory of God has left. The presence of God has left us. It's abandoned us. That's what she's saying when she names that child Ichabod. I feel bad for that kid having that name, but it was sort of a political statement or a spiritual statement, I guess. So basically, that brings us to chapter 5 because they're in this state of utter confusion and brokenness before God, and they needed this. I, I hate to say this, but this needed to happen for their sake so that they could understand how impoverished they are apart from God. This is God in a way, in, in, in a what it seems to us a judgmental way, allowing them in his compassion to experience life without his help. So in 1 Samuel 5, would somebody like to read verses 1 through 5? <clears throat> the Philistines captured the ark of God. They brought it from Ebenezer and Adam. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early in the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him in the back of the place. But when they rose early in the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both of the hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the truth of Dagon was left to him. This is why the priest of Dagon and all that entered the house of Dagon did not tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashtol to this day. Okay, thank you, Mary. So the Philistines capture the ark and they've got this great, this is a big bounty for them. They, they, they realize this is huge, this is wonderful. We'll look at this amazing treasure. We conquered their God and now we're going to take him and, and humiliate him and put him in the house of our God to show how inferior, inferior he is, uh, the God of the Hebrews, how inferior he is to Dagon, who is their god, the false god that they worship. 
and the Dagon is a um, was an idol, and it it may have had to do with a spiritual entity that did exist, a, a demonic entity that existed. Dagon's uh, the the representations of him often indicated that he was like half man, half fish, that kind of thing. So uh, that has to do partly with the connection that the Philistines had with Phoenicians and and uh, uh, their their trades and, and so forth, their commerce based on uh, sea on the sea. So anyway, so they uh, they bring the Ark of the Covenant to the house of Dagon, which is a temple to Dagon. And what happens to Dagon or the statue of Dagon? Fall down, falling down. Yeah, I mean, so they, <laughs> they all go to bed and they're just rejoicing. They probably celebrated and had a, a big Philistine party, you know, dashed out that night and. And the Ark of the Covenant, which is the that uh, symbol of the Hebrew God, is sitting there uh, next to their great God, what they think is a great God, Dagon. And uh, they all go to bed eventually, and they get up the next morning and they walk in, and lo and behold, what happened? Dagon is locked down. Oh, and they're evidently a little puzzled by that and maybe they just sort of rash figure out well maybe there's uh, been an earthquake or maybe i don't know who knows what happened so but they just set him up right they put him back in his place in verse three uh and then they go about the business of the day and then they go to bed again that night and and that and and uh, the next morning what happens again. it's fallen again only this time it isn't just fallen. What else? His head broke up. His arms are broken. Yeah, that's right. So when his hands are broken, it's it's a statement. You know, who's doing this? You know, I mean, <laughs> but it, there's a there's a there's meaning behind those broken hands. Dagon can't has no power to do anything. And the broken head, the head broken off, is is it's representative of the fact that he's not in control of anything. He's not in charge. He's been yeah, he never was, and they, and he is actually inferior to the God of the Hebrews because the God of the Hebrews isn't just God of the Hebrews. He's God of all creation, the God of all peoples, all nations, all languages, all tribes, for all time, everywhere. <clears throat> God is jealous about his glory. You know, and just because God allowed them to have victory in the battle over the uh, over the Israelites was not in any way uh, a a, um, a, uh, a step for God to allow His name to be denigrated or for His name to be humiliated in, in any way, shape, or form. God's going to take care of His glory. But there's there's something good even for the Philistines if they would pay attention to it in this. What would you say that is? And we're going to read more, and you know, we're not th through the woods yet with what the Philistines are going through. But what would you say is the grace in this for the Philistines? It opened their eyes to the Lord and yeah. the, the Israel. It it opens their eyes to the God of the Israelites. Yeah, and uh, it, although. In some ways, it doesn't look like there's a lot of change, so I don't know how open their eyes really were, but it certainly gave them an opportunity to see God, the Lord God, Yahweh God, the one true God for who he is. So would somebody like to read verses 6 uh, through the end of the chapter, 6 through 12? and he struck the men of the city 
both small and great, and tumors broke out on them. Therefore they sent the ark of God to Ephraim, so it was as the ark of God came to Ephraim that the Ephraimites cried out, saying, They have brought the ark of the God of Israel to us to kill us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel, and let it go back to its own place, so that it does not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there, and the men who did not die were stricken with the tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. All right. So um, it isn't just a one shot thing, was it, with this, the Ark of the Covenant being there by the statue of Dagon and Dagon, the statue, that effigy of Dagon being humiliated. What, what is happening? First in Ashdod, what happens in Ashdod? Boils and tumors broke out on Right. It, yeah, it, it says he ravaged them or terrified them and he afflicted them with all these tumors and, you know, there's this, you know, it, it's not just unpleasant to look at but you know in, in all likelihood painful and serious and they know and, and and because of what's said later on and toward the end of the chapter I'm inclined to think that in that in some cases it led to death so um, they're uh, they make a connection this doesn't just happen and like and they wonder why is this happening they make a connection they see something as having caused this this problem for their people, what is it that they think is causing the problem? The Ark of the Covenant. The presence of the Ark of the Covenant. So, um, they uh, they gather all the leaders of the Philistines together and, and they say, we're done, we're done, we're just done, we're, what do you want to do with it? Because we're done with it. And uh, they say, well, uh, take it to where? Gath, right. And now, Gath is probably a more well-known city of the Philistines for us. For what reason? Who came from Gath? Goliath. Goliath did. Okay. This is one of the. We, this is a much earlier reference to that city, but we see that city again at a later time. But they say, okay, okay, um, yeah, you, you bring it out of Ashdod and bring it to Gath and and so forth. And you know, they they uh, they don't immediately make the connection. That um, that this is something that's going to affect them as well. Why why do you think it's hard for them to let this go? Well, because it's made of gold. Gold. That's one thing. It's hugely symbolic to them for a huge victory for them over an enemy that they have in common. All the tribes of the Philistines, their enemy, are, of course, is the, are the Israelites. And they don't want to let go of the status that they have because the Israelites have a reputation for having overcome all kinds of enemies before. You know, we already named a bunch of them. Um, so they don't want to just let this go. And there probably is this idea that maybe, maybe, just maybe, maybe uh, their God is stronger than, um, than Dagon here in Ashdod because of another thing that the Canaanites tended to associated with their deities was a region or a territory and uh, often they felt like the gods of those people over there lived geographically over there and our god lives over here with us and you know you know that kind of thing and so it may be that they thought well maybe the god of the israelites is is we is strong in ashdod but won't be so strong in gath because we're pretty strong in gath so they bring it to the uh, to gath and what happens there more the same. More the same, yeah. And uh, in verse 9, after they brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a very great panic. And he afflicted the men of the city, both small and great or young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. And there's those tumors again. So then they do what? At Gath, they say enough of that. And after they go through a little bit of that, for a few days, and they send it to where? Ekron. Ekron. Third time's a charm. Surely this time they can handle it, right? And uh, but <laughs> its reputation preceded them because the people of Ekron say what? 
They're sending in the ark there to kill us. Yeah, they're trying to kill us over here. What are you trying to do to us? And so uh, they're not going to have it. So they gather all the leaders and uh, the lords of the Philistines and um, in verse 11. And uh, they say, you've got to get this out of here. Just send it away. We don't, we don't care what it means to you. We just get it out of here because it's, it's killing us. And uh, it ends in verse, uh, in verse 11, in the mid, middle part of that verse. There was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. And the hand of God was very heavy there. I just find that such an interesting expression. The hand of God was very heavy there. <clears throat> and notice what it said. It reminded me what it said in verse 7. The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us. And then look at what else it says. It's hard against us, and then it's hard against whom? Verse 7. It's hard against us. He's really being hard on us. He's being tough. He's he's punishing us, and you know this. We can't we can't handle this. What, but against he's they name someone else too, against us and against Dagon. Dagon. Yeah, that's right. Against and I find that interesting. They 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 realize that their God can't stand up to this God. Their God what? Yeah, that's right. Their God can't stand up to him. His hand is heavy, not just on us weak mortal beings, but on the God that we've been worshiping. The God we've been worshiping is weaker than that God. The God we've been worshiping is inferior to that God. God that we're worshiping. Now, what I'd like to say is that in that moment <clears throat> that they realize, you know, maybe we ought to not be worshiping Dagon. Maybe we ought to see about turning to the God of the Israelites. But they don't do that. They're terrified of him, and they just shuffle it around and try to make the problem of his presence someone else's problem until, in the end, they say, that's enough, and uh, we got to get it out of here. Don't you think when they speak about the hand of God being so heavy that that's, they're under a conviction? I, I think they are, but I don't think they realize it. I don't think that they understand that's what it is. And I think that's a good point. Thank you, David. When God is bringing conviction to our lives, how often do we miss the fact that it's conviction? We'll feel bad. We'll feel depressed. We'll feel discouraged. We'll be angry. We'll be resentful. We'll feel like somebody's doing something to us. We'll feel like the victim. And, and miss the point that God's trying to get our attention trying to get us to look to him, trying to get us to turn to him, trying to get us to turn away from all those things that we trust in that are so inferior to him, like Dagon is to God. We'll miss the point of that conviction, and I find that uh, we do the same thing today that the Philistines are doing here. God will be working, and we may even have some degree of realization this is God doing it, but we won't respond in a way that allows us to, to experience his goodness. You just want him out of here. There were times even up before this happened when God's people, um, after the Lord would speak to them through Moses or after God had delivered them in some way with you know, some very obvious, this is a God movement thing happening. And they would be terrified of God and they weren't sure that they wanted to go with God. In fact, they even had told Moses, we want you to talk to him because we don't want to talk to him because we're scared of him. I think a lot of people are like they want God at a safe distance. They may believe in Him in a sort of mental, intellectual way. They may even respect Him to a point, but they don't want Him too close because they might feel conviction. They might be challenged in how they live their lives. They might be challenged where they place their trust, and they're not sure they want to do that. So they'd like to keep God at a safe distance. Do you, you, do you know anybody who ever does? You don't have to, please don't name them. But do you know, have you ever encountered anyone who just liked to talk about God, but just didn't really want to walk with God? 
Sometimes that, that may describe us. It probably does at some point in our spiritual journey. One of the points of Lent <clears throat> is to get us as his children to the place where we really want more of him. So it's an appropriate time for us to talk about this. Where we don't want, well, well, we don't want only what God will do for us. We don't want just his blessings. We want to know him. We're thirsty for his word. We're thirsty for his presence. We're hungry to hear from him. We need him and we know it. And we, we, we miss him if we're not experiencing his presence in our lives. That's what Lent should do. It should help us to realize just how much he loves us and at the same time how much he should mean to us. So, um, so overall, their response is what? They, they, they keep dragging the Ark of the Covenant from one place to another. And every time they do, bad things happen, right? The tumors and so forth. And um, we're, I don't want to get into chapter 6 because this is um, how they solve their problem or how they think they, solve their, they got to solve their problem. Um, They just know that they have to get away from it or get it away from them. <coughs> so, um, what are some, did you read these words as we've read these words tonight? What are some lessons that you feel we should take away from having read them, these words? Yes. You should always stay in God's will. Yeah, yeah. You should always stay in God's will. That's right. That we need to remember where our strength comes from at all times. Okay, meaning that our strength comes from Him. Right. right? Yeah, that's a good point. We need to God number one. God number one. Yeah. What else? God's powerful. God is powerful. Very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's so many people out there that have felt the, the desire that they want to know the Lord, but they think it's like they think it's a self-help type thing that they, they're not ready to take this on yet. And what they don't realize is not them taking it on, it's them letting God take it on. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, 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 there's so many of them that, I, that I've talked to that they think they have to have their self ready before they right. can go to the Lord for, for the saving grace. And they're wrong. They could get to him any time, and he's going to help them through that time. Yeah. You know, to be able to come to the realization, I could do this through him. Yes. It's, you, you, you hear people say or make the... I think it kind of goes along with what you're saying. People will say things like, well, one of these days I'll get myself cleaned up and I'll get right with the Lord. You and I, we can't get ourselves cleaned up apart from the Lord. We can't do it. We can't do it. <clears throat> Our efforts to make ourselves clean enough to come to God uh, remind me of the scripture that say that our righteousness is as filthy rags before him. No. They were raised in a, in a Christian home, or they used to go to church all the time as children, just kind of fell away, they're all coming back, but that coming back seems like it never approaches. Yeah. Well, I mean, it does, but to some people, I've seen that it didn't appear to. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes the people will make choices that they're ashamed of, and they feel like, they just feel like they can't come back to God. And they miss, they miss the point. The grace of God. None of us can come to God. We all fall short of glory of God. It's only His grace that allows any of us to come to Him. And nobody has fallen so far that His grace can't save them. Any other thoughts?
All right. So, uh, Lord willing, uh, to, next week we'll um, look at 1 Samuel chapter 6. We kind of see a human um, way of trying to solve the problem of a sinful people before a holy God, and which kind of flows out of what we've been talking about tonight. <clears throat> Would somebody like to close us in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to Thee, Lord, and just thank You, Lord, for the lesson we received tonight, Lord, that it might help feed us and guide us, Lord, as we go our separate ways, Lord, we'll pray that You keep Your mighty hand on us until we can return again. In Your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.